Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for joining today for this QA session. So I believe today, yesterday was the World Yoga Day. So maybe we could have some questions on the topic of yoga today. So do any of you have any questions as of now? Yes, I, I would love to kick it off um, if that's all right. I mm -hmm. myself am a yoga teacher, Hare Krishna, Dandavat Pranams. And um, yoga is so popular in the West now, but as practicing bhaktas, we sometimes think um, or we question, you know, what is actually the true meaning of yoga and is it actually lost in today's world now? Um, are people practicing yoga but not really practicing the true yoga? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. See, sometimes, especially in today's uh, postmodern kind of world, as soon as we use the word true, it becomes, you know, whose truth is it? Who decides what is true and what is false? So I'd say that rather than talking about something which is a little more subject, which is often seen as subjective, let's look at it with an analog. Say if we have a treatment, if some there's some, some treatment, say now that we have the corona pandemic going on. So is a treatment true or is it a quack treatment? So how do we know that? I think broadly, we could talk about two things. There is a process and there is a purpose. So there's a so for example, if there's a particular vaccine that is developed, maybe in the next few months or next year or so, suppose a vaccine is developed, then there is a if the vaccine works, then the result should be that people should become immune. If there's a medicine developed, people should become cured. And there's also a process by which the particular vaccine is to be given. There may be, it's, it has to be ingested through the mouth or it has to be given as an injection or it's depending on how the particular, which part of the body it has to be given. There's a process by which it is to be administered and there's a purpose that should be served. So generally speaking, if you want to know whether something is uh, rightly being done or not, then we can look at these two things, the process and the purpose. So if a vaccine was say developed in America and say it is being administered in Africa, how exactly do we know whether it is being rightly done or not? So look at the process and look at the purpose. So similarly, when we talk about yoga, whether yoga is lost or yoga is there or not today, let's, we need to look at what is the process and what is the purpose? So at this, in today's world, at least yoga is associated with yoga sanas largely the yogic bodily postures and these as far as the process is concerned these are a part of the traditional system of yoga so yoga asanas are one limb so in that sense the process is being followed of course we could say that yoga has a lot of aspects to it and uh, largely only one aspect is being followed so in that sense, the process is being followed, but very partially. Now, as far as the purpose is concerned, that's where uh, we need to be a little more uh, cautious. Or most traditional teachers of yoga would have some hesitation in calling, calling uh, today's yoga as authentic yoga because the purpose is often being obscured. So traditionally, yoga was practiced for the purpose of uh, developing, it was a physical austerity, so that one could transcend this physical level of reality and come to a spiritual level. And ultimately, yoga, if as it was traditionally understood, it was meant to renounce the world and to uh, become absorbed in transcendence, to ultimately attain transcendence. So now, from that purpose of yoga, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita itself, it does talk about right in the beginning, one has to go to a secluded place, a forest and sit and uh, meditate and then gradually transcend. So that purpose is, uh, is hardly ever highlighted in today's practitioners, uh, among today's teaching of yoga. So we could say that at one level, 
because yoga is practiced primarily for physical health and not even physical health it is often for physical looks and when it is practiced for say look not just becoming fitter but looking more looking more attractive then and then what is the purpose of looking more attractive it is so that one can become more uh, one can and one can get more worldly pleasures so it is even yoga is practiced for sensuality hmm? for enhancing one sensual sensual appeal then definitely the spiritual purpose is being lost so we could say that whether modern yoga is is how much yoga is there in in modern yoga if you want to consider that we'll have to consider the purpose now who determines the purpose one thing is as in the tradition there is the purpose that the word yoga itself means connection or harmony so we connect with the ultimate reality we harmonize with the ultimate reality that's the purpose of yoga so in today's times when people practice yoga what determines their purpose one is that people themselves have a need and that's why they start practicing or there are teachers who talk about it and that and they they tell some purpose so prominently the purpose for most people is say health and looks so we could put it as a gradation so if somebody is practicing yoga for sensuality alone then definitely we could say the purpose of yoga is lost if that is all that is there i have seen say one book called yoga for sex then that is that is actually quite a antithesis of the purpose of yoga so then if we move forward if somebody wants health now health is not in it intrinsically spiritual but still at the same time we could say that is better it maybe it is better to pursue health by uh, stretching our body and and through the natural means rather than by ingesting chemicals in the body so from a comparative perspective pursuing yoga for health might be better than more intrusive ways of pursuing health hmm? so in that sense it is good now but still it is not necessarily it is not intrinsically spiritual what may happen is that if the practice of yoga makes people more receptive for the broader yoga tradition and the broader yoga wisdom then it can lead to lead to people pers- people ultimately fulfilling the purpose of yoga and that is happening so we can say there is a today there is a yoga industrial complex in which largely it has become uh, it has become commercialized and within that i i i don't know so specifically to talk about percentages but i would say as a small but significant percentage of people become more spiritually receptive the many of the icons of yoga are often say bollywood in india there are bollywood celebrities in america there might be hollywood celebrities now, these people are not really interested in spirituality and when people think about them people don't think about spirituality so if they to the extent they are icons of yoga then most people will pursue yoga for those purposes only but if at least the practice of yoga makes people more receptive to inquiring what what is this whole tradition about then that increased spiritual process activity we could say is an indication that at least there is some progression toward the ultimate purpose of yoga so i would say it's not a one zero answer uh, so it's a, some part of yoga will defeat the purpose of yoga some some part of how yoga is practiced some part Um, may not be connected with the purpose but it is better than alternatives available and some part of the yoga is conducive to its ultimate purpose but yoga as it is practiced in the west in itself very rarely fulfills the ultimate purpose of yoga in itself but it can be a significant stepping stone for people who would otherwise not have that stepping stone so if yoga would not be there most people might not even consider say eastern spirituality or even spirituality in general so in that sense for a, for a good number of people small but significant number of people it is a it is a it is a valuable stepping stone forward 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Um, actually, you you pretty much answered the main question that I had, um, um, which was really wondering if the, the yoga that we practice in the West is just you know a, a ritual or or you know just physical and without any spiritual benefit. Um, and you kind of answered that, but I was also wondering after all of that. How do we use um, yoga asanas to help us get to a more spiritual place? How do we bring the spirituality into it? Okay. In general, the idea is that whatever we do, it consumes our consciousness. And say, for example, if you're talking right now, it, it engages our consciousness. Now, there are some activities which require our conscious attention. There are others which do not require so much of conscious attention. Say, for example, if you're walking on a road, now we need to be alert of what is the traffic, but we don't necessarily need to be conscious of everything that we are doing. Say, if we are doing our laundry or if we are doing washing our plates, we don't necessarily need our consciousness too much over there. So what happens if there, if those kind of activities are routinized, then once it becomes a routine, we know this is what is to be done. And then our consciousness can be engaged or absorbed elsewhere also. So, so in that sense, yoga, the physical asanas of yoga, they are like routinization of the body so that the consciousness can be freed and made available for something higher. The, um, the yoga asanas are meant to create at a basic level a sense of uh, physical harmony or physical well-being and then that can free our consciousness upward. So often the yoga asanas in trans English are translated yoga postures or poses, yoga stanzas. So if we consider that word uh, in sports, in baseball or in cricket, you know, different players, the batsman, batter might have a stance. So they stand in a particular way so that when the ball comes, they can hit the ball. And if, and the purpose of the stand is not, it's not a matter of style. And the stand is, is the, the stand it's, is not an end in itself. The stand is a, is a launching pad, is a, is a tool by which the end of hitting the ball most effectively can be pursued. So similarly, yogasanas are meant to be like a launching pad for our consciousness to be raised upward. So now in our tradition, Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about this in Prema Pradeep in uh, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is a prominent book of yoga. And in that uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur refers to that. And he has a discussion between it's a fiction, it's a non-historical or a fictional depiction where say there is a devotee, there is a Vaish devotee, bhakti yogi, who is just practicing bhakti yoga. There is a bhakti yogi who is also practicing say ashtanga yoga. What we call today as yoga is mostly ashtanga yoga. It starts with physical practices. And then there is also um, a person who is a, a seeker or an in in inquirer. So the idea is that what Bhakti Thakur says is sometimes for some people, the practice of Ashtang Yoga may help them to discipline their bodies and mind better so that they can, their consciousness is more available for the practice of exploring higher levels of consciousness and ultimately uh, realizing the, the, the personal complete aspect of the Absolute, which is realized through Bhakti Yoga. So in that sense, for some people, Ashtang Yoga might be helpful for pursuing Bhakti Yoga. And in today's world, health is becoming a problem because in many ways, our lifestyle is not as naturally, say, mobile. It's more sedentary. It's less, uh, it's less, uh, we often live in polluted elements and stuff like that. So it's helpful if we all can have uh, some, some practices to improve our health. So if it is anukul, if it is favorable for our pursuit of transcendence, 
then the yogasanas can help us can be adopted for doing that okay thank you thank you yeah so from what you spoke i understood that uh, i mean i i deduce that not all forms of yoga lead to the same goal is that true and uh, it's like as you mentioned that uh, yoga the ultimate purpose is to connect and harmonize with a higher reality so is it that all forms of yoga lead to the same goal and and okay. would yoga help us attain that ultimate goal something like yeah now when we talk about various forms of yoga traditionally there are broadly four the word yoga itself is used for yogasanas and it is associated with with the path of ashtanga yoga also called as dhyana yoga um now the initial parts of ashtanga yoga are sometimes called as hatha yoga now let's not get too much into the names but if we consider broadly speaking there are there are four paths of yoga there is karma yoga if we look at it from the bhagavad gita's perspective so when we talk when we want to use terms we also have to have some reference points or source texts for those terms so the prominent yoga texts uh, are patanjali yoga sutra and also the bhagavad gita the patanjali yoga sutra focuses primarily on ashtanga yoga which is which talks about the eight stages of yoga when involving yogasana by which one can ultimately attain samadhi that is spiritual absorption spiritual trance uh, now the bhagavad gita uses the word yoga much more generically see the word yoga itself means etymologically it means connection or harmonization so the bhagavad gita uses it in the sense so karma yoga means connection through action gyana yoga means connection through knowledge the knowledge connection dhyana yoga means connection through meditation and bhakti yoga would mean connection through devotion so if we consider broadly speaking uh, these yogas each of them has a particular focus see we have our mind we, we have body mind intelligence and heart hmm. now all the yogas will engage all aspects of our being but there is a primary focus so in karma yoga the primary focus is karma we act with our body now, of course what we think what our conceptions are what our aspirations are all those matter so what we think refers to what our thoughts are refers to our mind what our overall conceptions are refers to our intelligence and what our aspirations are what what do we ultimately want to achieve that refers to our heart so we could say actions thoughts conceptions and aspirations all these matter in the bhagavad gita 517 krishna talks about tat buddhayas tad atmanas tan nishthas tat parayana ha so he talks about similarly four things which we need to have so to ultimately achieve transcendence now in karma yoga the primary focus is on action one needs to have a conception that that there is some detachment that i don't want simply the fruits of my action i want to pursue something higher in my life so that conception definitely is required but the primary focus is on action in dhyana yoga the primary focus is on the mind we recognize that the mind is restless and refocus on the refocus the mind calm the mind drain the mind of its various passions so we see the sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita which talks about dhyana yoga focuses a lot on managing the mind and then the mind gradually is focused on transcendence if you see in the bhagavad gita 6 chapter the focus is more on the mind than on the transcendental reality on which the mind is to be focused of course there is a transcendental reality to focus on but the primary thrust of the gita is not on describing that reality it is on describing the process by which the mind can be focused on that reality and the ultimate reality krishna just mentions in the last verse yogi nam api sarvesha madgate nantaratmana that among all yogis the topmost yogi is one who fixes their mind on me so in gyan yoga in dhyan yoga the focus is more on the mind and what we do with the mind in 
ज्ञान योगा द फोकस इज मोर ऑन आवर कंसेप्शन एंड इट इज प्राइमरली ऑन डी कंस्ट्रक्टिंग आवर प्रेजेंट कंसेप्शन सो डी कंस्ट्रक्टिंग मीन्स दैट वी ऑल ऑपरेट एट अ फंक्शनल लेवल बेस्ड on the presumption that the things around us are real so if we knew that a, that in if say we are in desert and if we knew a particular thing is a mirage then we won't go toward it to gain water so in our day to day lives we pursue wealth we pursue appreciation recognition and position and prestige now why do we pursue these things we may philosophically understand that oh you know okay these are not these are temporary these are not eternal but still we pursue them we do consider them as worthwhile so the process of gyan yoga is intellectual deconstruction of what we consider to be reality so the pursued reality that we have say we see attractive objects that taste good that look good that smell good that feels good that feel soft to the touch whatever so we are attracted by such objects so the process of gyan yoga involves intellectual deconstruction that everything is at a, at ultimately just the physical elements earth water fire air ether and a lump of earth if i have somewhere i'm not going to be attracted by it there's a glass of water if i'm thirsty i'll be attracted but it's not going to be that like i'm not going to write poetry about a glass of water so i'm not going to get infatuated by it so we deconstruct it so that's why the primary uh, exercise on the path of ashtang yoga of dhyan of gyan yoga is na iti this is not the reality this is not the reality this is not the reality na iti and then ultimately then eventually we deconstruct the material manifestations into the material elements and then we see the material elements themselves are temporary earth water fire also is temporary then gradually one we move toward something higher beyond it and then transcendence is pursued that way so the thrust is on deconstructing our present perceptions of reality in gyan yoga in bhakti yoga bhakti means devo love or devotional love in bhakti yoga the primary focus is on channeling our emotions toward the divine so it's more that we redirect our heart so earlier i used the word aspiration so devotion is considered devotion is often equated with the emotion but it's not just a emotion it's actually the emotion that is our aspiration we have many different emotions in our hearts sometimes we feel angry sometimes we feel de depressed sometimes we feel lonely there are so many emotions so when we say bhakti yoga devotion is not just one emotion among many emotions that we have rather when in bhakti yoga devotion is like the driving emotion it is the emotion that underlies all other emotions so bhakti yoga is the emotion connection so in bhakti yoga the primary process prime the primary thrust is on uh, refining our emotions so that our driving emotion of devotion uh, connects us with transcendence so in this uh, in the process of bhakti yoga the refinement of emotions is the thrust and that is done primarily by exposing ourselves to spiritual stimuli which uh, which lead to our uh, emotions getting attracted to the spiritual stimuli say for example we go to a temple and take darshan of the of the form of the lord then by that darshan what happens our attraction toward that form increases and when that attraction to the form increases then we feel we feel uplifted so that it, and then that emotion starts becoming more prominent and then other emotions start becoming uh, less prominent they become subordinate so then so the so the idea is that each of these paths of yoga they involve a particular faculty of ours primarily and other faculties secondarily so because different people are of different natures so these variety of paths accommodate different seekers on the spiritual path so some people who are more rational and intellectual 
analytical and intellectual the path of gyan yoga might attract them naturally hmm? uh, people who are more activist kind no the path of karma yoga might attract them more hmm? so the idea is transcendence can be like a big umbrella within which everybody can be included that's one way of looking at the various paths of yoga and all these paths of yoga all these yogic paths will promote transcendence will help the person to move to a transcendence so in that sense all of them are authentic all of them are potent now do all, do all, so in, the, in that sense do all paths of yoga lead to the same goal well they lead to the same goal but they may not take us to the same extent they they are all it's, it's it's like if you consider yoga to be one like one express way all these paths are taking us toward the same goal so they say all paths do they lead to this all yogas do they lead to the same goal yes but they may not lead us all the way to the same goal the ultimate reality we uh, so even by practicing karma yoga one will develop some detachment from the world and one will develop some greater receptivity toward the ultimate reality but one may not one may not become absorbed in the ultimate reality because that is not the thrust in in dhyan yoga the the focus is more on calming the mind then on connecting with the ultimate reality so that's why if we talk about the yoga sutras the conception of the ultimate reality that is described in the yoga sutras is also not very vivid yoga sutras talk about the ishvara but an ishvara pranidhana is surrender to ishvara is one limb but who is that ishvara that is not described much why because that is not the primary thrust so so one will so in one sense uh, calming the mind is vital is is important even vital for pursuing and perceiving transcendence at the same time calming the mind if the focus is on calming the mind then the focus is not exactly on transcendence so only those aspects of transcendence that help us to calm the mind they are what are revealed in the texts which talk about ashtanga yoga so that's why now there is the we could say there is the aspect of the absolute which centers on oneness and that just calms us and that is what is the thrust so the idea in uh, many yogic texts not entirely but the the idea that can be drawn from them is that the perfection of life is to calm the mind yogas chitta prutti nirodha whatever are the agitations of the mind just calm them down the perfection of yoga is when the mind stops being the consciousness stops fluctuating but okay that's good but what after that so what is the object on which it focuses that is not the primary thrust so again through the practice of yoga one does attain transcendence but one one may not attain a very vivid understanding of transcendence because the purpose in pursuing that was not attraction toward the transcendence was primarily freedom from at the agitation of the mind similarly in gyan yoga the focus is more on understanding what is the reality not on loving the reality so we see in the bhagavatam this dynamic the first verse of the bhagavat bhagavatam has this mood of dhimahi dhimahi is meditate meditate so in ashtang in in gyan yoga after one deconstructs all all temporary forms of reality then one comes to the ultimate form of or the eternal for enduring form of reality and when we come there at that time the thrust is on 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 absorption but absorption is more in terms of contemplation or meditation because again the idea is in this it's we just want a clear intellectual conceptualization and emotions or emotion of love for example is not activated in gyan yoga in fact in gyan yoga 
emotions are perceived as obstacles to perception hmm? it's like when you are emotional then you can't perceive things properly so if somebody is speaking something and if we are too attached to that person or if we are too averse to that person then we don't really clearly perceive what they are saying so the the conception of the absolute truth here is more of a object or a concept and for understanding a object or a concept we need calmness hmm? uh, uh, so however see there is an analytical way of understanding the absolute truth so in gyan yoga the primary purpose is analysis and when we want to say suppose somebody wants to study some physics solve some mathematics sum now uh, if somebody is very emotional or excited at that time then they can't really do the steps properly they might feel very happy on solving the sum but for solving it itself you don't need too much emotion over there in fact emotion comes in the way so there is analytical way of approaching the absolute truth now in bhakti yoga that same absolute truth is approached more from a aesthetic perspective say to understand this difference if say if we consider a rose flower now consider the way a botanist a scientist approaches a rose flower and an artist approaches a rose flower uh now a uh, scientist might say okay you know this is the andrusian this is the gynaecian these are the carpels these are all the biological parts and all that is valid that's one way of looking at it and even a scientist might spend hours studying a flower now an artist or a poet or a painter when they approach a approach the painting Uh, approach a, a rose it will oh this this is so beautiful this is so artistic this is so fragrant so it's a different way of approaching it's not that one is right and the other is wrong still the fuller experience of the rose will come when we approach it from an aesthetic perspective so there has to be aesthetic sensibility now is the aesthetic sensibility an emotion well yes it is not emotion in the sense that even an artist might not be jumping up and down in uh while looking at a flower but still there is a certain emotion involved in the appreciation so in bhakti yoga the same ultimate reality is approached from a aesthetic perspective so that's why uh, all yogas lead to toward the absolute truth but the way the ultimate reality is perceived will be different based on the way we are approaching so all the yogas lead us toward the same goal but they do not take us all the way to that same goal okay thank you very much prabhu this was really nice thank you happy to your service yeah any other questions um absolutely <laughs> you keep answering my questions before i ask them <laughs> um <laughs> I just actually thought of something else as you were um speaking about bhakti being um more of an appreciation for the aesthetic um kind of aesthetic yeah. part of, of the lord of god um I was thinking that almost sounds uh sentimental rather than um okay you know rather than yeah. having a deep connection to god through bhakti okay yes do you, do you get what i mean so when we talk about aesthetic conception aesthetic connection it sounds sentimental mm -hmm. well see there are two words sentiment and sentimental sentimental is where a person is controlled by sentiments and the rational faculty is having no place at all mm -hmm. now sentiments are important sentimentality is undesirable but sentiments are entirely desirable see for example say if you if you have a problem with your phone and you call online help and they have a robotic voice and artificial intelligence responding to your queries now you know that might be rationally responding to everything but you know we 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 want to connect with the person isn't it isn't it so if we want to develop a relationship it it has to be personal 
so the one way to understand it is that um, when we connect with people we there has to be an aspect of rationality to it but if the connection is only rational then it's not a very deep connection when do we really connect with people there is intellectual agreement yeah that did lead to connection but there is also uh, as i said a linking of the heart that's why i i uh, i recognize that the word emotion has a certain uh, almost uh, negative connotation associated with it or you just be emotional or sentimental but actually emotions can be so if we consider at a level that is emotion and there is reason and often we see reason is deeper than emotion reason is sounder than emotion which is true but actually there is, we could say there is a level of emotion that is below reason also that is deeper than reason say for example uh, sometimes our emotions tell us to do something which our reason knows is wrong hmm? but if we consider conscience our conscience tells us that something is wrong or something is right now we might not be able to come up with reasons for it but we know this is right or this is wrong so now when the conscience tells us something like that what is the point over there that is emotion but it is at a much deeper level the heart has its way of knowing which which the mind which the which the head head cannot reach so i'll give a simple example to illustrate this that um, nowadays there is a uh, there is uh, abortion has become more or less uh, uh, standardized and legalized in most parts of the world now there are uh, abortion advocates who strongly say that the a fetus is just a tissue it's not a child uh, there are some extremist abortion advocates who want to do the abortion till the say the seventh month eighth month or whatever very late now there was there is one atheistic philosopher who said that who wrote in the journal of bioethics an article was published which said that in principle there should be nothing wrong in aborting the baby even after the baby is born even after the baby is born and when he published that it just it just uh, it appalled people but and people there was a lot of negative criticism uh, condemnation but then he, he said all these arguments are simply sentimental he said every single argument you are using that can be used to stop abortion in the womb also from a biological perspective the location of the of the of the embryo doesn't determine its status so if the embryo can be terminated while it is in the womb then why can't it be terminated after it comes out so it don't be sentimental now when we here when you talk about sentiment it's not just sentiment in terms of sentiment against reason See, there is sentiment that uh, that that uh, sabotages or contradicts reason, but there is also sentiment that grounds reason. Now, when we love someone deeply, when there is a deep connection, reason has to be a part of it. But reason, there is there is a connection that goes deeper than reason. So, if we consider from that perspective, when we talk about bhakti yoga, even on the path of bhakti yoga. when we talk about the sentiments that come and go the re, the emotions that are fickle bhakti yoga also has a significant amount of disciplined practice by which we go beyond those sentiments we purify ourselves of those sentiments and bhakti yoga does ground us in reason but then it takes us to something beyond reason so we could say uh, there is there is irrational there is rational and there is transrational so normally when we talk about sentimental that sentimental is equated with irrational but when we talk about devotion as a emotion that is transrational it is reason is definitely there but there is more than reason there is more than logic more than analysis there is a deeper connection that transcends reason it includes and it transcends reason Does that make sense?
Thank you. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, you had mentioned a lot about bhakti yoga, um, and I wanted to, I guess, hone in a little bit more about that. Specifically, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 16, it mentions the four types of pious men who turn to God. The one, the distressed, uh, to the one who is looking for material opulences, uh, the inquisitive, and one who is really in search for knowledge and truth. Um, so if yoga can lead you to that ultimate goal, uh, where does yoga actually fit into these four types? Um, and does bhakti yoga, these four types come and then they take the bhakti or bhakti yoga is also within these four? Okay. Thank you. Now in 716, when Krishna talks about these four yogas, four types of people who come, He's specifically talking about those who come to him for practicing. In that sense, for practicing, for worshipping him, which we could say is a part of bhakti yoga. But that can be applied generically to any practice of yoga also. Why would somebody practice yoga? Because they're in distress and because they're too sick and they want some relief in terms of health. Or you know, they are healthy, but they want to, they want to be fitter, they want to look more, uh, look more become, want to become slimmer or look better. That they have some they have some desires because of which they're coming or this inquisitive maybe their friends are into yoga they want to know what is yoga all about or it could be because they have knowledge and they're pursuing okay yoga is a way to transcendence and i want to pursue transcendence so so those four categories of people they can that categorization can be applied to yoga also although specifically in there krishna is talking about bhakti yoga they come and worship him chaturvidha bhajante maam bhajante maam He's talking about in that sense he's talking about those who come to him now just as krishna talks over there that among these four kinds of people those who are more in the in knowledge the tesham jnani nitya yukta eka bhakti vishishyate those who are in knowledge they are the best situated because they will be progressive and then through progressive spiritual evolution they will attain the complete understanding the jnanavan maam prapadyate they will surrender to krishna they will attain krishna so, so similarly, we could say that those who come to yoga for either just some health or some uh, becoming slimmer or just out of curiosity, they may not sustain their yoga practice. Uh, and in that sense, they may not, pers they not pursue yoga till they attain its ultimate purpose. But those who come with knowledge are more likely to pers pursue yoga till they attain its ultimate purpose. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. I have another question. Um, actually, I wanted to ask in regard to bhakti yoga, and you were mentioning the other paths of yoga. And I was wondering if the other paths exist because um, a soul doesn't have enough sukriti to get to bhakti yoga yet. And also, I was wondering what were um, or what determines why a soul would be attracted to a particular path. Okay. So is it that the other paths exist for those who don't have enough sukruti for practicing bhakti? And what determines why the soul will be attracted to a particular path? I would say that this is something which uh, can be polarizing because generally what happens within the practitioners of every path, there, there is some tendency to try to establish their path as the best path and that's not necessarily bad because if one is following a path they need to commit to it and if one knows oh, this is not the best path but i have to practice it then the wholehearted commitment will not be there so in that sense say for example if somebody is planning practicing jnana yoga they might basically say that what you, you mentioned earlier that Oh, bhakti yoga is for sentimental people. We are rational people. We are intellectual people. So they may consider jnana yoga to be superior and bhakti yoga to be inferior. Now, this in itself is not a bad thing. To see, there is uh, to consider my path to be special is not a bad thing at all. But to consider my path to be supreme 
so much so that other parts have to be condemned and that is unhealthy so within so now the distance between the difference between my path is special and my path is supreme now for some people that distance is very clear for uh, some people that distance is not much they just easily go from considering their path to be special and beneficial and potent to being the best and in fact other paths to be condemned so now so so from that perspective every path has its potency and every path has its utility and so yes it is depending on our own psychophysical nature depending on our own past uh, upbringing present past conditionings present conditions we will be attracted toward a particular path so so that is uh, just like say how many people many people today in the west are attracted to yoga now if they were presented bhakti yoga they might not directly if they are presented bhakti yoga they might not be attracted to it if they are directly presented ashtanga yoga or directly presented karma yoga gyan yoga they might not be attracted to it so what attracts a particular person it's often one's past conditions past impressions and one's present conditions what kind of situation one is coming in that determines who gets attracted to what and is it that people who are not attracted to bhakti yoga don't have sukrutis <clears throat> yes we could say that everybody is at a particular stage in their spiritual evolution and based on where they are they will be attracted to certain things so if somebody associates with devotees and learns to appreciate devotees by that association then that itself will create the sukruti sukruti basically means we could say uh, unknowing credits or we could say appreciation basically if there is appreciation then there is a greater openness to exploration and then commitment so rather than thinking that oh these people who are not attracted to bhakti yoga don't have sukruti that's why they are not attracted we need to see that let me if i am practicing bhakti let me try to conduct myself in a way by which people will develop the sukrutis so let me try to be kind gentle uh, and uh, sensitive helpful whatever way i can be and so shri prabhupad says in one lecture that it is the responsibility of devotees of bhakti yogi is to make the unfortunate people fortunate so those who don't have enough fortune we don't say oh you are unfortunate that's why you're not coming here no we try to create that fortune we create try to create that uh, that sukruti that appreciation in them as much as is possible for us okay thank you yes. prabhu ji i have a question yes. so um, as you mentioned the other parts of yoga so all parts of yoga don't lead, they lead us to the same goal but not to the same extent so uh, for example if i want to practice bhakti yoga um do i have to give up the the aspiration to attain success in some other yoga for example if i want to succeed in bhakti yoga for example so do i have to always keep in mind and let's say i am attracted to the dhyana yoga aspect do i have to always keep in mind that succeeding in dhyana yoga is not my ultimate purpose but my ultimate purpose is to uh have my ultimate aspiration okay. to serve you know yeah so i would say there are two distinct levels and two different approaches to it uh, if you consider the manual of devotion that is bhakti ras amrit sindhu at one level rupa goswami says yena kena prakarena mana krishna niveshayate somehow or the other fix the mind on krishna at another level he says anya bilashita shunyam yana karma dinavartam anukulyena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama he says that have no other aspirations have uh, uncover your tendencies towards karma and jnana and have that that faculty purely so here when he is referring to karma and jnana basically what he means is that in the path of jnana it is more of perception observation meditation we interact with the world in two broad ways one is we take in information from the world and the other is we act in the world 
So karmadi anavrutam means that sometimes we might just enjoy how much of an impact we are having on the world. Sometimes we might just enjoy how how much we can meditate on the world, how good it is, or how how attractive reality is. So don't get caught in either. We do even as bhakti yogis, we need to observe the world. We need to act in the world. But a devotee doesn't delight in simple meditation. Nor does a devotee meditate delight in or how much of an impact I'm having. A devotee's primary delight is in connection with Krishna. While connecting with Krishna, a devotee will be observant also and relish the observation. While connecting with Krishna, a devotee will also contribute and will be will be happy if the contribution is having an impact. But the primary connection is not action on the world or observation of the world. The primary focus is on connection the source of the world with Krishna. So uh, that is when he is talking about such a, such a, this is devotion which is anyavyaya shashuni jnana karmadi anurutan anukulena krishna nu shilanam bhaktir uttama uttama this is pure or transcendental devotion so now that uttama bhakti is our aspiration that's the level we want to get to now to get to that level we can't we want to get there and we have to be clear about that but we can't to automatically presume we are there so at our level we we intellectually know we or at least we conceptually know that that is the ultimate aspiration but we have at operational level take up what is favorable and avoid that which is unfavorable so if if somebody can't just simply be absorbed in krishna then they may want to do some practical services and then they get some appreciation some glorification by doing those services oh i distributed so many books i did this many things i did this many things and that also gives them some satisfaction now that satisfaction is not entirely devotional satisfaction but it is within the ambit of devotion hmm? so similarly somebody might just study a lot and while studying they may not be remembering krishna so much oh i understood this concept i understood that concept i discussed this oh that was great now even if the thrust is not krishna in that it's more of meditation see that the driving mood of a devotee is service so our action is for service our contemplation is also for service but some people might be habituated more toward contemplation service might be more secondary yes that's fine so it doesn't matter so i would say at our yes in the ultimate sense we need to give up everything else to become perfected in bhakti yoga at our level however we need to see how we can fix the mind on krishna so if the tools of ashtang yoga say for example deep breathing or doing some asanas help us to focus more on our chanting or some of the tools of uh, gyan yoga help us to contemplate better on philosophical concepts then we can use those Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Since we are talking about the other paths, um, I was really curious to uh, understand um, the other three, other than, for example, bhakti. When you mentioned that karma yoga, it's connection through action. Gyan is connection through knowledge, and dhyan or stanga yoga is in connection um, through meditation. But typically, for example, when you hear of someone following karma yoga, it's associated with one who offers everything, uh, their their work, their fruit of work, to the Lord. Um, but it's typically associated with someone who has a lot of I would say a lot, but has material desires. Um, so does that mean that if someone is following karma yoga, they have to have a lot of material desires? Similarly, we know that gyan yoga, as you mentioned, is really deconstructing the reality, but it's also typically associated with renouncing the world, going through some really harsh austerities to break the worldly attachments. But if one were to follow gyan yoga, does that have? Is that the process that does that have to happen? Um, and even the word gyan, we know, means knowledge. We're cultivating knowledge right now by hearing your wonderful philosophy and okay. krishna kata so uh how why is it so different from gyan yoga uh, and then lastly with the shtanga and uh shtanga yoga typically one follows that to want to develop mystic powers but 
does that have to be the case if someone wants to follow Dan Yoga? Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a big question. Uh, let me, uh, let's talk with one and then I'll apply to others. Uh, let's talk with say, Jnana Yoga, like the cultivation of knowledge. Now, as I said, all the limbs, all the yogas include all the limbs. But what is primary and what is secondary, that will vary. Hmm? Now, as devotees and as practitioners of Bhakti Yoga, we also cultivate knowledge. Hmm? No doubt about it. Jiva Goswami in his uh, Shatsandarvas talks about how the knowledge, the Jnana of a Jnana Yogi is different from the Jnana of a Bhakti Yogi. And he talks about broadly three things. Uh, what is the content of the knowledge? What is the intent of the knowledge? And what is the consequence of the knowledge? So the content of the knowledge is Aham Brahmasmi. I am spirit. I am Brahman. I am the ultimate reality. That is the primary focus. So we could say that the focus is on oneness with the spiritual reality. Whereas in Bhakti Yoga, when we cultivate knowledge, the focus is on the glory of the ultimate reality. In Bhakti Yoga also we understand I am spiritual, I am eternal, I am Brahman. I am, I am also Brahman. But that is not the focus. Our focus on Bhakti Yoga is on how glorious is the Parabrahman. So in that sense, the content of the knowledge is very different. It's, it's spiritual knowledge, but not about oneness, of the, oneness with the Absolute, but the uh, glory of the Absolute, the opulence of the Absolute. Then so, so in intent, generally the jnana of a jnana yogi is meant to uh, attain a kind of state of merging or oneness with the absolute. Whereas in intent, it is to and in bhakti yoga, the purpose of jnana is to develop more and more attraction and appreciation for the absolute. Hmm. And in consequence, the in the jnana actually leads to a stultification of emotion, to almost like an eradication of emotion. Uh, whereas in Bhakti Yoga, the Jnana leads to a purification and intensification of emotion. Emotions are purified, but then after they are intensified. So in that sense, although it's Jnana, but the, the intent, content and consequence of the Jnana are very different in Jnana Yoga and in Bhakti Yoga. That's why when, so that's why we can differentiate between Jnana and Jnana, Jnana and Jnana Yoga. So Jnana Yoga means knowledge itself is the primary basis of the connection. And Aham Brahmasmi, that, that is the intent and that is the result also. That is the consequence also. But it's not like that in a devotional path. We want to understand the glories of the Lord so that we can become absorbed lovingly in Him. So... That's with respect to Jnana. Now if we come to Karma, the word Karma has different connotations. Karma at one level simply means action. Now Karma also means fruit to action. Action which is done for getting worldly results. Generally a person who is doing Karma Yoga, it's not that that person has a lot of material desires. If they have a lot of worldly desires, then they would do simply Karma or Karma Kanda. They won't do Karma Yoga. As soon as yoga is there, that means there is some understanding of something spiritual and something transcendental. So if somebody does simply some rituals for gaining wealth, for gaining power, for gaining worldly prosperity, then that is, that is what is called as karma kanda. It's not karma yoga. Karma yoga means there is an understanding of transcendence. However, the conception of transcendence is not very clear in karma yoga. What is the ultimate transcendental reality? In Karma Yoga, the understanding is, okay, this world is entangling and one has to pursue a reality beyond this world. If the understanding is clear that actually there is a person who is the ultimate reality, that, is the, or that all attractive person is Krishna, then the pursuit of transcendence, then, the, then that is not just Karma Yoga. That is what Vishwanath Chakritaka call, calls as Bhagavat Arpit Karma Yoga. That is Karma Yoga. So in one sense, I earlier talked about the process and purpose. Process and purpose. 
so in one sense the the person might be doing the process of karma yoga in the sense that they are doing various works and other things they are doing various works in the world but their purpose is krishna and in that sense it's not technically karma yoga it's actually uh, it's part of bhakti yoga itself and in fact krishna talks about this he introduces the principle of karma yoga in the from the second chapter onwards the third and fifth chapter is also called karma yoga uh, now after talking about how karma yoga leads one higher and higher toward transcendence then in the 12th chapter krishna talks about how one can work with detachment as a limb of bhakti also in the 12th chapter he talks about how if one is at the highest level of practicing bhakti from there if they are completely absorbed in krishna if they can't be absorbed in krishna then they strive for absorption in krishna if they can't strive for absorption in krishna then they work for krishna and if they can't work for krishna then they work for some good cause detaching themselves from the fruits so when krishna is talking about here at this down this downward ladder this is broadly within the ambit of bhakti yoga so then when somebody knows that krishna is the goal but somehow they cannot work for krishna right now then they are not simply doing karma yoga they are doing bhagavat arpit uh, bhagavat arpit bhakti yoga or uh, bhagavat arpit karma yoga so which is very close to bhakti yoga does that make sense yes just a quick clarification in the very beginning you said uh, all these limbs you mean these these paths the other paths are contained within you meant bhakti yoga so technically when you practice bhakti you are actually covering the other limbs is that correct is that what you meant uh well when you say it's not exactly like that within bhakti yoga when one may not do the various limbs of ashtang yoga but the so when i talk about our faculties karma yoga involves more of the body gyan yoga and dhyan yoga is the mind gyan yoga is the intelligence and bhakti yoga is the heart so bhakti yoga involves definitely the hands the head uh, uh, the the mind the intelligence all of them are included in it but the primary focus in bhakti yoga is the heart so in terms of the aspects of the human person bhakti yoga incorporates those aspects of the human purpose person that are also incorporated in in the other yoga paths of yoga but the specific processes of other paths of yoga bhakti yoga may bhakti yogi may or may not practice them did that address your question I I believe so. Yes, thank you. Uh and then lastly when you said that when we can't just fully absorb then you're talking about karma misha bhakti, gyan misha bhakti, ashtanga misha bhakti. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So Okay, uh, thank you so much. So we are having those inclinations and there are components from those areas but we are moving toward bhakti. Okay. So any last question? Or should we conclude now? uh just one maybe from an outreach perspective how do we uh, make people understand that uh, make people understand the need to practice yoga many so we see that uh, sometimes when life is going all good uh, we don't really feel the need to really aspire for anything so how do we how do we make people feel that need yeah how, how do we I, i think there are two aspects to it one is that we could say before the pandemic came upon us we were living from a historical perspective at a time of relative uh, peace and prosperity we look at the previous century there was the first world war second world war then afterward you know major upheavals some things came up but nothing major so now this has become something which major so the world periodically brings serious adversities and it reminds us of the inadequacy of worldly prosperity and worldly peace alone and that itself can be an impetus along with that it's broadly we try one is say because the world is a place of distress so we pursue transcendence but another is also that uh, whatever the world offers it offers but it's not enough so one is what the world what the world offers is terrible so i want to turn away from the world the other aspect is what the world offers is not good enough 
it's not enough so when when there is no distress then i think that aspect that um, the world what the world offers is insufficient is inadequate that is what we need to stress so one way to do that is look at what are people's current interests and see where the practices of yoga or the principles of yoga intersect over there so just like with respect to health and fitness and looks that was where at one place where intersection happened and that's where people are practicing yoga now so we need to resourcefully and when we are approaching people try to understand what their interests are and see how what interests them presently can intersect with the ambit with the purview of yoga that's why we may also have to need a, we may we need a very inclusive understanding of what yoga is it's not just specific practices but it's a whole way of living and a way of look, looking at the world so then we can find out where the two intersect and then kindle their interest in that area of intersection and gradually they may explore yoga more in future okay so thank you very much for the very thoughtful questions and the stimulating session hare krishna thank you so much hare hare krishna thank, thank you, you so much thank you, so much. Thank you. Hare krishna hare mom <laughs>